Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. And I am your COVID-ridden host today, Jill Escher, president of NCSA. Um, Yes, after three years of really not getting sick at all, COVID found its way into my body. And um, I had many days in bed. And now finally, I am emerged um, from my cocoon, but uh, not 100%. So you will notice in my voice that I sound sick. You will see that I look sick. And that's because I am sick. (laughs) But fortunately, um, due to, uh, you know, technology and everything being virtual, I can actually conduct this interview without infecting my guests today. Um, so a couple, uh, uh, remarks before, before I start with our really wonderful guest, um, our last many, you know, podcasts, um, were largely based on input and suggestions from listeners. And, um, they were great suggestions, by the way, I thought our, our last few series have been excellent. Um, and uh, we received many, many more um, in the past couple of weeks. And those suggestions have all been excellent. And I just want to thank everyone for sending them in. I'm not sure we can get to all of them, but I'm pretty sure over the next couple of months, we can do most of them. So please be a little patient um, as we uh, build, build our schedule. And please, people, keep them coming. Um, we are at info at, at, at n csautism.org. Um, so with that, um, I think we are going to uh, go ahead and start this one. And let me tell you a little bit, a bit about a back, the background here. This one actually came from a, a listener suggestion. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had written up a review of a book, a new book about Bittersweet Farms, which is a pioneering residential and day program in Ohio. And um, people were super interested. Many people had never heard of Bittersweet Farms, um, even though I think it's the first of its kind serving adults with severe autism in a farm, like in a farm setting. And um, people just wanted to know more. They said, please, you know, put it on the podcast. So we are very, very, very grateful that Dustin Watkins, I can't even talk because I'm COVID ridden. Dustin Watkins, (laughs) the executive director of Bittersweet Farms is with us today. Um, And uh, Dustin has been with Bittersweet Farms for 23 years. He started there as direct support as kind of a summer job. (laughs) Little did he know that 23 years later, um, he'd still be there, and he's been the ED there for just under six years. So, welcome, Dustin. Thank you, Jill. It's wonderful to to, to be with you. Uh, I'm sorry you're not feeling well, but I appreciate you. You're a trooper. You're doing great. You sound great. You look great. Um, but uh, I, I uh, really appreciate it, and I appreciate uh, uh, all of the uh, members and listeners that uh, suggested uh, that I come on and uh, share a little bit more about Bittersweet, which I always love to do. So, thank you. Good, good. Um, well, I'm going to talk as little as possible. <laughs> so I'm just sitting here sneezing and coughing all the time. Um, but um, let's just start off with very basic information. Can sure. you just describe Bittersweet Farms, like where it is? I know you guys have three locations now. How many people you serve, um, the kind of programs you have, maybe a little bit about the history. Just give the sort of broad brush overview. And then I think we'll go down into some of the details. Sure, sounds good. Um, So Bittersweet Farms uh, was founded in 1983. So we're having our 40th anniversary this uh, year. And uh, we were the first farm-based, agricultural-based program for adults with autism in the United States. Uh, We are headquartered in White House, Ohio, which is a suburb of Toledo. Uh, We are located on 80 acres, uh, half of which is kind of the open space where our buildings and barn and uh, greenhouses are located. And then the back 40 is uh, wooded 
and uh, has hiking trails. We harvest wood there. And uh, we are also, we share property with the local Metro Park, uh, which is great for us as I'll, I'm sure, talk about uh, some of the uh, aerobic uh, activities that we try to make part of our daily uh, milieu. But um, we provide uh, residential services uh, through uh, an in intermediate care facility, as well as waiver-based uh, residential services. Uh, we have three homes in our ICF that serve 20 people, and then we have uh, two apartments that are HUD-funded uh, apartments uh, through waiver uh, services, and those are uh, six apartment units in uh, two different buildings, so there's 12 people who we serve there. Uh, we have a group home for four women uh, that is also waiver-based, and then we have another uh, group home for uh, three men uh, in Pemberville that uh, we provide services for, and then a few people who live in their own apartment in the community. Uh, our largest program is our day program in White House. Uh, on any given day, we serve about 60 to 70 people. Two thirds of them uh, we serve residentially. Most of the people we serve residentially attend our day programs as well. Uh, but then the other third are individuals that live uh, either in their family home or another provider or on their own, and they come attend day services here. Um, we have many different things in our day program. Uh, we have a very uh, active and uh, robust uh, art department uh, that makes a lot of really cool things. We've got a uh, community supported agriculture program where we grow and produce, um, uh, we grow uh, produce that we uh, harvest from seed uh, to harvest. And then uh, members of the community then can subscribe to shares uh, that they get a fresh box of produce each week. So we do a, a spring, summer and uh, fall share for that. Uh, we've got uh, an animal barn where we do animal care. Uh, we've got a janitorial crew. We've got a groundskeeping crew. Uh, we've got a very good culinary uh, crew, and they make uh, some uh, two delicious cookies, uh, which is a gift and a curse around here. But um, we have a lot of different activities going on, and we, we tier our program in a way that uh, we have uh, recreational, habilitational offerings, uh, pre-vocational and kind of an apprenticeship type of uh, uh, track, and then compensable uh, work, which is uh, all above minimum wage uh, once skill mastery has taken place. So um, we really try to make sure we have a, a lot of different things so that we can uh, provide, uh, uh, you know, options and choices for uh, the people we serve. And a lot of times our program will adapt to the interests and uh, abilities of, uh, of our participants. Uh, we also have a, um, our other locations are in Lima, uh, Ohio, so about an hour and a half south of us on 75. Um, and that is a day program uh, where right now we serve about uh, 17 individuals uh, in uh, their day. That is, uh, there's some good things going on there with some gardening and some animal care, but they also do a lot of community-based volunteering uh, and um, uh, activity. And then we, uh, closer to White House, we have an adolescent transition program for uh, adolescents from different school, local school districts who are just struggling in their home school district, uh, typically because of behavioral challenges. And we contract with the schools to uh, provide their services in Pemberville, their educational services and uh, behavioral support uh, to help them get ready for uh, adulthood. Wow, that's a lot <laughs> of services. But uh, in short, it, it seems like you have approximately 40 residential clients, um, about um, 20, about half in ICF funded right. accommodations and about half with HCBS waivers. Yes. Right. So the, the ICF was how we were, uh, when we were founded, that was kind of the only option. So that. Uh, many of the people who live in our ICF were our founding residents. Uh, mm -hmm, 40. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Uh, so, um, and then the remainder, maybe I I'm going to say almost 80 total. The, so the balance of those, the other half of those are um, uh, day program clients on two different campuses. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's great. So really what, when I read the book, um, what I found so remarkable and so precious and so rare <laughs> is that Bittersweet is serving adults with 
some extremely challenging behaviors. What usually happens, what I usually find in, especially in the residential realm, but it's also true in the day program realm, um, is that those adults are routinely rejected Mm -hmm. from, you know, being eligible, sometimes even to, you know, apply. (laughs) Um, And um, so we hear a lot about, oh, look at this new, you know, IDD housing development, look at this new autism housing development. And then you look at their criteria for admission and the criteria exclude people who often, not always, but often they they don't have independent living skills. Like they can't go to the bathroom by themselves. Sometimes Um, they can't take care of their own hygiene and they exclude challenging behaviors, any form of property destruction, aggression, self-injury, for example, elopement. Um, but you're you know, reading that book, the appendix was the best part of that book because <laughs> the appendix went into detail about client after client after client after client, you know, their whole histories, their whole programs and who they were. And most of these people would never have been accepted, right? At other programs, but sure. yours does. And that makes you stand out remarkably in, in, in the crowd. And I want you to, to talk about that because this is the main complaint of, you know, parents in my situation and people who are involved in NCSA, you know, they are often very desperate to find lifetime homes or mm-hmm. even day programs for their adult children. And, um, they, they, they run up against this wall. So, how do you do it? <laughs> How, and tell us, uh, t- you know, maybe you can give some examples of some of the clients and, and what they were like when they first entered the program and, and how the program has changed them. Sure, sure. Um, well, so I think, you know, the sad part is that um, I think what you describe has always been the case, but I think it's even getting worse because of the workforce shortage, right? And so we're keenly aware of the uh, fact that uh, particularly with, uh, you know, the, the, the people who need the most support um, typically need the most rapport, right? And that's a process. And so, you know, there's a few things that we, we do to kind of make sure uh, that we can be successful and, and helping people be successful. Um, one is, is that, you know, at um, anytime we have an opening, we have an admissions committee that isn't necessarily tasked with uh, screening people out, but really making sure that as we go through our waiting list that we understand the full scope of that that person's support needs and capabilities, and that we can be confident in the fact that we have the proper resources, the proper staffing to provide uh, for their needs. Um, and that involves direct observation, going to where they're at now, sometimes bringing them in in a staggered way and, and exposure because it's a new environment too. So we don't necessarily make presumptions that, you know, because their collateral, you know, information reads a certain way that that's exactly what it is. It could be because they're not getting the appropriate support. They're not in the right environment. And, you know, we're also aware of uh, the fact that, you know, we love this, this, uh, this philosophy and, and, you um, uh, this environment, but it's not necessarily for everyone either. So we always want to make sure it's a good fit. So we'll even have people come and join us for a day uh, and just kind of see how it goes and make sure that it's a good fit. Uh, service compatibility is the other thing that we really spend a lot of time on. So a lot of uh, the challenge too is making sure that if there's you know an opening that the other folks in that home or in that area uh, are are at a a good match in terms of their service need and they're not pulling away from each other. And um, the other piece is just really kind of making sure that uh, we're preparing our staff, we're training them um, in terms of, you know, what the anticipated needs are going to be. And we're supporting them through the process, especially in the, the initial stage. When we bring somebody new into the program, we typically either see, you know, that they're doing pretty well in the beginning. I, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of a honeymoon stage, it may seem like, you know, things are, it's a new environment and it's going really well and it takes a few weeks for things to start presenting themselves. Or we see initially right away, there's that that reaction to a new environment and unknowns. And we see more uh, support needs uh, in the initial weeks than after they get in the groove for a while. 
Uh, we tend to explore different areas too, particularly in our day program. Um, a lot of people who come to us, they don't really know what they like or what they don't like. And, and so we have the ability to um, just explore. And usually we'll spend at least the first couple of weeks giving them exposure to the different areas, getting feedback from them, getting feedback from the staff working with them to fine tune a schedule that is aligned with their interests, their needs and their abilities. And usually that you know, is, a, is a pretty critical piece. Um, and I do think that um, you know, the, the benefit and the resource we have is space and variety. And I think for a lot of individuals, they just haven't had that before. So there are a lot of- Yeah, variety. It's like, it's like a little college campus, like, you know, <laughs> or, or a camp or something. I mean, um, it, it's, it's amazing. As you, you were talking earlier, you have, you know, horticulture, you have baking, you have art, you, you have music, um, you have all kinds of athletic sports slash recreational activities. I mean, I would want to live there. Like, <laughs> I, I, if you have a pool, my son will move in. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, it, 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 it does sort of seem like, like autism, autism dreamland. But, you know, it, I think I'm, I'm not going to answer your question for you, but just reading between the lines, what you were just saying about like, why are you able to take these clients that other people increasingly pass up, as you just notice, it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, staff, right? Yeah. You yeah. have staff trained and willing to work with these people, but there's something else. Another word that I think you mentioned was setting, right? Like, do you find that this open, big farm setting is conducive to decreasing the behaviors and decreasing the need for intensive supports over time? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, this is an important point. I want, to, I want to talk about this quite a bit because you know, farms and farmsteads, anything rural, anything agricultural has been kind of um, maligned in the disability community for years as being um, uh, you know, isolating or institutional. And I'm like, are you kidding me? My, my son, if he was living in some apartment would destroy the apartment and be miserable. You put him in the great outdoors. That's all he wants to do. He spends his entire life outdoors. That's what he wants. So it, it's, it seems like what the disability advocates are saying are the opposite of true for a lot of people, not for everybody, as you mentioned. Can you, yeah, so anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up and I want you to talk about this important point. Sure, yeah, no, so I think, one, I do think, you know, we have to fight against the legacy of some programs that could seem like they have similar elements that were not what bittersweet is and were not what uh, we're trying to do here um, and, you know, our history. And um, I think that- uh, that Your, is your history was that you were created by, I forgot the woman's name. Betty Ruth K. So yeah, she, yes. she was um, a powerhouse. Yeah, um, she sounds like an amazing person. Um, yeah. It sounds like she did it as an alternative because she believed so much in her students, right? She was a teacher and she believed in them and in their potential and wanted to create um, a place where, where they could thrive. And so it's like, it's sort of ironic, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, so, you know, she was a, a teacher in the Toledo public schools. She was working with some of the same people we serve today, um, but she would do these great things in the classroom, uh, very, uh, very informed on autism, uh, especially for the time, but they would graduate and their only option was to go into workshop settings or no, you know, post-secondary anything, right? And so she, along with the, the parents of these students, uh, got together and they started looking for models out there and they went to uh, Somerset Court. And that is when she in, just- In England. In England, yeah, yeah. in England. And um, which was the first in the world, first farm-based program in the world for people with autism, said, this is the model that I think is, is you know, what we need came back and started Bittersweet here. Um, the first piece of property, actually, we had that NIMBY response from uh, the neighbors. And although she knew she could push it through and be there, her attitude was, we don't wanna be anywhere where the neighbors don't want us. 
And I think it was serendipitous because we ended up on our setting now, which uh, to talk about it is one thing, but to see it as a whole different story. It is a very, very beautiful setting. So not only is it uh, beneficial for our participants, but it's beneficial for our employees and our staff too, for the very same reasons, right? And um, in the book, they talk about eco-psychosomatics and all the benefits of nature. And, and you know that's definitely clear and apparent that that is uh, part of the ingredient of uh, our success. It's also the ability to uh, space out and, but what our founder understood uh, in looking at the, the agricultural model is that, um, you know, doing farm work agriculture is inherently meaningful. And part of our philosophy that we use is a, it, we use an acronym uh, called MAPS. M is for meaning and motivation. So the whole idea that if somebody doesn't understand the meaning behind something or it's not meaningful to them, they're not going to be motivated to do it. So a farm agriculture type of environment provides plenty of, uh, you know, meaningful activities. We, you know, there's always something meaningful to do. We've got to take care of animals. We've got to water the plants. There's, you know, and it also flows with the season. So we tend to plan and, and uh, coordinate with the seasons as well. So going back to that kind of college uh, campus schedule kind of th thing, uh, that's funny because I use that uh, ex uh, analogy a lot. But we kind of each season we say to the individuals, you know, what do you want to work? Where do you want to work for the next season? So it's also not forever. And it may be staying in the same place that they've been. But they also know it's kind of an organic way of saying, OK, now we're coming into winter. And there's certain types of activities that we do in each area during the winter that may be fundamentally different than what we do in the summer. And so it provides that variety too with the changing seasons. Um, you know, the A in MAPS stands for aerobic activity. So we try to embed that in everything we do and having an 80 acre campus really provides a, a lot of resources for us. We've got a full-size track here. We do a lot of hiking, biking, swimming, um, you know, and even just the day-to-day -day, uh, tasks and activities, we will sometimes do less efficiently in order to gain the physical uh, input of that. So uh, yeah, we could go and chop down a lot of uh, lumber for our uh, wood burner stove and, and uh, you know, do that with a uh, chainsaw but we'll break out the two man saws so that we can get that uh, reciprocity and that physical activity. Uh, the P uh, in MAPS is for partnership with purpose. So we're at our best. It's uh, when you cannot tell who is staff and who is participant because we're engaged in everything together. We have to do this, not you or me. Um, and, and that is uh, something that, you know, we really make sure our, our team members under, understand. And then the S is for those structured supports that we know that people with autism need to be, uh, you know, successful and thrive to know what's coming up. So that could be, you know, their, their structure throughout their day, uh, visual supports, communication supports, and obviously all individualized to the person. So the farm environment provides, um, you know, not only all of those elements, but it just provides that space and that interaction with nature. Um, you know, the people that uh, benefit from this like getting their hands dirty. They like um, to do things. And, and in some cases, we take something that maybe used to be maladaptive and we turn it into an adaptive uh, skill. So we've got individuals who will tear their clothing. And uh, you oh, know, you that... must have met my son. <laughs> <laughs> how, so, do you, how do you turn that into something adaptive? I want to well, know. <laughs> well, we have a fiber arts uh, um, area department where they make beautiful rugs, uh, table runners, placemats, and they use fabric that's been ripped. So we really try to get all of that out through functional, you know, we're making a product and we give them fabric to rip. Um, and we have individuals who will do that all day and we'll see that it will diminish their need to rip things and other elements of their life. And it gives us a do to place, uh, put in place of a don't. Oh my gosh, I'm sending Johnny over to Ohio. <laughs> You'll get a Californian. You'll get a box from California next I week. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So how uh, you know it it does seem like for kids like like Johnny and probably many like him, it does seem like really the the most appropriate setting for him. I mean, right now he's the, the irony is this, he does live in a neighborhood. He lives right near us. 
in, in a house with, with staff, you know, we're there every day as well, but it's just like him and staff in a house, you know, um, it, he, he has the, the, there are, his regional center hasn't offered him any programs. He has no programs. His staff will, you know, take him out for walks and hikes, but he's nothing structured, nothing really purposeful. I mean, I'm, we're working on it, but it's very hard when you have somebody who's that severe, um, you know, to build something, you know, just for him with a sort of skeleton crew. Um, and, you know, it, it's just so ironic to me that, you know, these programs that are maybe campus-based are presumed isolating, right? And not community oriented, but like where my son lives is presumed community oriented, not isolating, but the exact opposite is true. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. it, it boggles my mind that these myths persist. I'm sure that in some cases that might be true. I mean, but you know, it, in a case like yours, I guess like Johnny's, it's not, um, how have you had to deal with any um, kind of critiques, uh, attacks on your model? H has it come up when you've done your HCBS waivers? Has it come up in any other way? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so first off, I'm with you that uh, community is not a, a thing, right? It's, uh, and yet I think that it, uh, as simple as it is, I think a lot of it is driven by the fact that the people who are writing these rules tend to be in an urban centric, metro centric kind of, uh, you know, uh, location. And so I personally live uh, four miles down the road from Bittersweet. Uh, I see, uh, you know, I don't consider myself isolated in the community and I see our participants, residents everywhere. Um, they're like local celebrities. Uh, and knowing that, I mean, we still wanna make sure that we are maximizing opportunities uh, that are person-centered for people to be in and of their community. And we feel that we're doing that. But the one thing that uh, we're really uh, always trying to do is be as transparent as possible to say, come see, come see for yourself. You cannot judge it based on, uh, you know, just labels that, uh, you know, associate a value to you. you. If you come here and you see, you will see that this is anything other than isolating. We have a ton of reverse inclusion. We have a lot of the community coming here and we're going out in the community a lot. It also comes down to those personal choices. I mean, the one thing that, um, you know, if we were on a bus line, we probably wouldn't face as much scrutiny, you know, things like that. And nobody uh, begrudges re retirees who wanna go live in a retirement community with other retirees, right? But in this case, um, there's that argument that, um, you know, the people with autism shouldn't be living and working with other people with autism. Maybe that is the case for some folks who don't get the benefit of being here in a shared environment with folks with, you know, similar challenges. But what we see is the community here, you know, we've got a community within a community and there's, there's, uh, you know, involvement going on across uh, those, those platforms all the time. But, um, you know, we we're serving individuals who were totally isolated in their community. They, uh, before they came to Bittersweet, um, there's individuals who really had no friendships to speak of, uh, despite trying and despite having, you know, access, uh, you know, through the school system or whatever, they've just had a very kind of a subdued life because of their challenges and the environments that they were in. So just being here and sharing in that, I mean, we, we have one individual who really did not speak much at all uh, before he came to Bittersweet. And now he's like our, our mayor, he's our ambassador. He, he welcomes every person that comes to the, the farm. Um, and I think it's it's that social capital. It's it's um, not only do I have individuals who have similar challenges, but I can also see individuals have different challenges, and it helps builds you know this kind of sense of empathy in a way that I don't think they would get otherwise just by talking about things, uh, if that makes sense. So you know, for me, it's uh, we have faced scrutiny. Uh, we worked with uh, the Department of uh, Developmental Disabilities here in Ohio for about five years to get ready for heightened scrutiny from uh, the the, uh, the federal uh, side, 
And um, there were things, you know, we have a, a gate at the front of our property, which many people around here do, uh, which was actually put in place uh, several years ago. And, you know, things like that were kind of brought into question, things we have on our sign, you know, so we, we did what we needed to do to get into to compliance. Uh, Wait, but, and, but a gate, I mean, most properties have a gate. Right. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have friends with farms and ranches and they have gates. Right. So why was your gate viewed any differently? Well, I think with this, um, DODD was very supportive of wanting us to be okay. I think that we're highly valued in the state and it was more of an approach of, you know, we're not sure how stringent they're going to be when they come in. So oh, these are okay. potential red flags. And ah. if it's not absolutely necessary, maybe we should rethink what we're, we're doing. And to be honest, we weren't even using the gate. It was just there. So yeah. it's kind of like, well, you know, we don't need to worry about it too much. But um, I think it's, you know, it's it's making sure that um, whoever may be coming in and whatever their, uh, their, the stereotype they may be carrying for programs like this, we're not uh, kind of presenting in a way that makes those more ingrained. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, We've been confident. We worked in good faith to kind of make sure we were doing everything we were doing. But to your point, I know that we're in the community a lot more than other programs that nobody's looking at because they just happen to be in the center of a downtown area. But I, you know, there's people we serve, have served in our day program where they're getting the most social interaction, even with the broader community, by coming to Bittersweet than they are you know, in their residential group home uh, in, in, you know, downtown Toledo. Oh, I, I have no doubt. <laughs> no, <laughs> no doubt that's true. Um, yeah, it, it's just, I find that the way HCBS is being administered, I just want to say is obscenely absurd. And um, it should be revised from the bottom up. Um, but, you know, I, I hope you're living within the parameters that have been set forward, uh, you know, with the settings rule, um, just making sure we do everything we can to get these types of programs to make them sustainable and viable, which brings me to my next question. Sure. You guys have a wait list. So I, I'm going to guarantee you that right now, listening to this podcast, there are at least a hundred parents who are listening and they're like, how can I get my kid in, right? <laughs> they're, they're in Florida, they're in Washington, they're in Arizona, they're probably in Ohio too. They're all asking that, right? Sure. And of course, you guys have a wait list. It's not like you're like, hey, everyone, come on in. Um, so, well, I guess first, if people did want to get on your wait list, um, what should they do? But more importantly, um, let's talk about how people can possibly copy the bittersweet model um, in their own states. Sure. Um, so if anybody is interested in being on our wait list, you can go to uh, bittersweetfarms.org and you'll find information about our program as well as information about um, getting on our wait list. Uh, you can also, I'm happy to uh, provide my, my email. You can reach out to me. We've got uh, uh, somebody who handles our, our wait list and can kind of uh, also give uh, some feedback as to how large that is because we keep separate waiting lists for different our different programs. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to some of the challenges we have, especially with people coming from out of state, funding can also be a challenge. So we've had people on our wait list who come up on, you know, for us, but they aren't on the wait list for a waiver or their number 2000 on the wait list for a waiver and they don't have a funding mechanism. So that can uh -huh. be uh, one of the challenges. Um, sometimes, um, you know, in, in different states, you're going to have a different take on this kind of model. There are a couple things that I think. Do are sometimes, I'm, pardon me for being naive uh, no. here. Um, so not 100% of your clients are on an Ohio waiver, right? Or the mm -hmm. HCBS clients. So right. they, you get waiver dollars from various states. No, no, Ohio. I'm sorry. No, no they're all, so. Anybody on a waiver in Ohio is on the Ohio waiver. It does not transfer across states. So they have to be receiving okay. an Ohio waiver. 
Okay. Um, and it's a little complicated beyond that because Ohio is one of only three states with a county board system. So we have 88 different county boards that kind of serve as the, the county oversight who then okay. the, the Department of Developmental Disabilities writes the rules, but then there are 88 different counties. So it depends right. on what county you're working in and the funding is uh, you know, nuanced as it goes through uh, some of those channels. But um, there's a, a couple important things to know. One is I don't think that we could build Bittersweet as it exists today, today uh, from scratch. Uh, we've been kind of grandfathered in, we started a certain way um, it, it, and we have, you know, so we've got our day program and ICF, and then we've got our uh, community living residential programs on adjacent properties, and then we've got our group homes out there. Um, I think there would be more scrutiny building that from scratch today than what we had when we built those things and everything was, was good to go. Um, each state probably is going to, and my understanding of the uh, settings rule is that each state is also kind of interpreting those in different ways. And some are a little bit more uh, stringent than others in their interpretation of the uh, settings rule. So that's always a factor as well. Um, I think, you know, as you, is it, talked about in the book, I think quite a bit and um, comes up quite a bit when we, we talk to people who are trying to pursue a model like this. It's, there's a lot of hoops to jump through, but building it and getting a piece of land is just, you know, one sliver of, of, you know, what it really requires to make this work. So one, you want to make sure that before you invest anything, before you uh, really get too far ahead of yourself, that you're working with your state, local, you know, policymakers, uh, to, to make sure that what you're thinking of is done in the way that uh, they feel it should be done uh, per your state, just to make sure it's, uh, this is one of those things that you definitely want to get a green light before you start uh, getting too far ahead of yourself. Um, and you can use those folks hopefully as partners to, you know, if there are some prohibitive uh, factors that they can help you overcome those things. And it's, uh, you know, shaped in a way that prevents you from having uh, any kind of liability uh, from anybody coming in and saying this model uh, isn't allowed. We, uh, you know, we have through the past uh, had a lot of people come visit Bittersweet to learn about what we do and how we do it. Uh, there, you know, there's the funding pieces behind it. There's the staffing piece. Uh, I would say the staffing piece is probably one of the more challenging aspects uh, in the workforce crisis. Uh, you know, we're 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 impacted. Uh, right now, I can say, you know, as we talk about our ability to serve those with uh, the most support needs, um, we're not able to do what we were able to do 10 years ago just because of the challenges. So we're really taking on more of a capacity mindset of, you know, we still need to maintain and do this to the fullest extent because we're aware that if we can't do it, there's not a whole lot of options out there for folks. Um, but we're not able to serve who we used to be able to serve uh, to a higher level of success. And so I think service compatibility that I touched on, usually these programs are started by parents. The parents are the movers and the shakers and the ones who, who get this stuff done. And so I, I would advise that if you're working with a group of parents, you also make sure that you're being pretty objective and open and transparent about service needs and abilities and making sure that there is some service compatibility uh, because that can make all the world a difference. You know, so usually these programs kind of start small with two or three people and then we add on. Um, so in the beginning, that's, you know, it, depending on the dynamics, that can be a factor or it can be a factor later on. Um, you know, and it really comes down, we're a very regulated industry and, uh, you know, just making sure you understand what you're getting into uh, before you, you do that. But I always try not to burst anybody's bubbles. You see the energy and the excitement and the determination, uh, particularly of families who want to uh, create a model. Uh, and I try to uh, really make sure I'm not... Um, diminishing that while also trying to impart like, you know, especially the settings rule and things like that, that people are fully informed uh, before they, they put all the, the stock into. What yeah, 
it it makes me nuts that the attitude from CMS and also from the state DD or you know health you know it de depends on which state it is what department is administering the Medicaid money it makes me nuts that the attitude is about how can we put the brakes on this? How can we scrutinize it, right? How can we throw wrenches into it? Rather than, man, this stuff is so desperately needed. How can we support and make this a success? You yep. know, the attitude is 180 degrees wrong, you know? And I believe that the disability rights community has cultivated this negativity about you know, particularly residential solutions, but also, you know, day program and, you know, kind of employment solutions as well. And I'm like, why? Has anyone looked at the numbers lately? Has anyone seen the desperate need, right, for all huge variety of programs serving a huge variety of, of adults with sometimes significant impairments? I mean, we need a, a, a giant attitude adjustment. Right. I mean, so that I'm not saying like, Oh, you know, magic wand, we will make new farmsteads everywhere. Boom, boom, boom. I know it, I know it's hard. Listen, I'm in the residential services business. Um, I, I have I think 13 adults with um, developmental disabilities right now who are my tenants. And I know it involves a lot of complexity. I'm not even a service provider. Um, and so I don't sugarcoat anything. But nevertheless, you know, why aren't we like, Hey, you want to start something for people who want to work outdoors and be in community? Let's do it great. Yep. You know, and I, I suppose it comes down to money and that's part of it, but I think a lot of it is just really wrongheaded, uh, dogmatic ideology. Anyway, but I pontificate where I shouldn't be pontificating. <laughs> Sorry, I, I do no. that a lot. I can't, I can't help it. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, I'm I'm past I'm past my uh, my my thirty minutes here <laughs> quite a bit, but um, if, if people want to learn more about Bittersweet Farms, they can go to your website, which is bittersweetfarms.org, right? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, and I will also put a link um, to the new book yes, about please. your model. There it yes. is. He's holding yeah. it up for those That's of right. you who can't see it. It's called "Creating Quality of Life for Adults on the Autism Spectrum." And it's, it's a really great uh, book to give you a deep dive into what we've been talking about, uh, some of the elements of how we go about doing uh, what we do each day. Uh, it has been uh, uh, just a, a really cool thing to see it be able to come to fruition and um, be out there in the world. So there were two things that were missing from the book, though. Let's talk about those before we close. Sure. One was it didn't really go into the financial model at all. And I'm sure that's sensitive information in, in many ways, but let me just ask you a couple broad questions about it. Sure. Do you find that in the ICF program that all your costs, all the necessary costs are covered through Medicaid dollars? No. No. So we have a phenomenal development team, fortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to fundraise for about 15 to 20% of our operating costs each year. For for all across all programs, across all across programs. all programs. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So um, and I should program. say, everybody, um, they basically got this land for free in the 1980s. <laughs> um, and I don't know what your property taxes are, but like here in California, it would be so incredibly cost prohibitive to do oh. anything like this. Like you, you can't imagine. Um, but if you had like a property tax workaround, which sometimes, uh, you know are available that 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 would help so okay so so between your hcbs and your icf you're funding that funds like 80 to 85 percent of your yeah, give or take give, uh, give or take yeah okay and so do pa pa families don't have to pay private or maybe you do have some private pay clients from time to time very minimal private pay, uh, yeah. not necessarily because of anything other than we haven't really developed a, a structure for it. And we've been so kind of uh, focused on serving who we have served. And, um, you know, we're talking about that as we go into the future of uh, a space for that. But we also want to make sure that we're able to provide services to people who need it and not just people who have the financial resources to, to fund it themselves. 
Yeah, of course. And um, I don't know anything about Ohio about Ohio waivers, um, but uh, I assume a lot of your clients need one on one at least during the day, maybe not at night. Um, is there a special waiver that pays kind of enhanced rates for more challenging clients who need higher levels of support? How, how does it work in Ohio? Well, everything's assessment based. Oh, so, okay. Um, they give you a funding level based on your individualized assessment, which is based on the environment and how that influences. Um, there are some behavior add-ons um, in certain areas, but like in our day program, for example, the day services, your levels of funding are either at a, a one to three, a one to six, or a one to 12. So if you're serving somebody at a one to one, you're doing that at a loss uh, because the funding does not cover one to one services. Now there's you know supplemental funds you can get to help offset that, but those are factors that also prohibit um, organizations from taking those folks on, especially in a day program where they're not serving them residentially because they know that automatically they're going to be at a loss. Our attitude isn't that if somebody requires one-to-one -one supports, we're worried immediately about, you know, losing money, but we look at it as an investment of, you know, are they benefiting from the program? Are they making, you know, uh, you know headway? Are they developing skills? Um, and if so, then, you know, that's an investment and hopefully we can get them to a, a situation where they don't require that level of support, which may or may not be the case, uh, depending on the person, but um, it, you know, the funding is limited. Uh, you know, the, the workforce shortage in itself was obviously happening well before the pandemic. Uh, it just kind of uh, put everybody on uh, an accelerated path. And for years, Medicaid funds were frozen uh, or cut, and, you know, and so there weren't, we weren't keeping up with the rate of inflation. Um, there are some good things happening in Ohio right now. Uh, we're eager to see uh, the governor's biennium budget um, to see how much uh, investment there will be in DD services uh, because uh, it is a crisis and there has to be more funding. Most organizations have gone into their endowment, uh, long-term, uh, you know, rainy day funds to be able to provide the wage increases that are just necessary if you want to have anybody. And so that's not sustainable uh, for the industry. And if there isn't renewed investment back into Medicaid to bring this back to not only a, a, a cost of living, but also, uh, you know, to compete with Amazons and all that stuff, um, then it is going to be uh catastrophic. So I'm uh, opted. Yeah, and that's uh, across the country. I mean, right. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's it, well, but in, you know, what needs to be understood is if you're not paying for it up front, you're going to pay for it reactively and it's going to be more expensive and at the peril of people's lives, their quality of life, and in some cases, their immediate uh, health and safety. So yeah, uh, what we, what we see really across the country is this phenomenon of young, usually almost always young adults with severe behaviors. And, you know, they, they end up in the ER because their parents, you know, can't get the crisis, you know, services that they need. And the ERs are like, we don't know what to do with them. <laughs> right. And there's no quote unquote beds for them. And there's no step down facilities and there's no long-term care facilities. Right. Well, something like that is going to cost a hell of a lot more, right. Yeah. Than a program yeah. like yours. Yes. Right. But I, I don't know why people don't don't see that, you know, and, um, you know, you're right when you say it, we have to, it, you know, this is not an, an, an option where it's like a luxury item. It's like, this is something that has to be done. These are people who need to, who need care. You have, you have three choices. How about how you're going to care for them? Yours is actually probably the least costly. Right. Yep. yep. I mean. Not that I've seen your numbers, but I've seen, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's just numbers. amazing how reactive everything is. Just one anecdote. Um, I remember we had an individual assessment tool uh, that we were, we were wondering, you know, we were working with somebody that was very, very uh, involved and we just weren't able to figure out why they weren't getting the funding to match their level of support. And we sat with the team and we redid their, their individualized assessment and we changed one score 
and it was a question related to how often does this person uh, tease or ridicule their peers? And we changed it to the next highest one. It was not, and we have no idea what it's weighted. So it was a fair, good faith kind of, I think we can bump that up one notch to uh, the next level of frequency. It changed his funding by $30,000. Now this was a while ago. This is a number of years ago, so I think it's it's better now. But um, you know, it just is a good example of you know, we didn't get that money for you know preventing those things from happening. We got it because they happened, and you know, you, you see that a lot. And uh, I think it just takes an awareness and an awakening to kind of understand that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right. Um, so agree. Um, and then the other question I had reading the book was you know, frankly, with adults with this level of complexity and severity, a lot of them are um, on sometimes a variety of, of medications or need various medical interventions. Um, you talk, the book talked quite a bit about behavioral interventions. Um, do you guys have like a, a staff doctor, like staff psychiatrist? Like, what do you do you know uh, about working with their their med their medication needs? Good question. Uh, I'm glad you actually asked because this is our next kind of frontier, which is the aging of our our founding residents who are all in their 60s, some of them in their 70s now. And so um, we have to we're we just completed our three year strategic plan, and this is front and center to make sure that we're. Uh, investing in our medical services to the degree we need to, to help people age in place and be healthy and uh, stay here at Bittersweet for as long as they possibly can. We do not currently have 24 seven nursing, but we have an amazing team of nurses. And right now nurses are in very short supply as well. So we're very fortunate. Um, and we've got a director of nursing. We have a very small team, uh, but we've got a director of nursing. Uh, they do the, you know, Medic, medication management uh, in our ICF, you know, where most uh, of our folks with high medical needs are living. Uh, wow. in, but they also advise and support our waiver folks. Um, so they're here um, to, to provide, uh, you know, any kind of uh, counseling feedback uh, input as, as needed. Um, we have a physician who is our medical director who comes here to the farm on a monthly basis to see the individuals directly. Um, so he's seeing them and getting updates, looking at documentation, talking to team members, talking to that individual. Parents will come in uh, to be a part of that appointment as they feel they need to. Uh, and we, um, you know, we also have de delegated uh, staff in our waiver program to be able to pass medication as well. So there's a delegation uh, that takes place there. But our goal is to get to a point where we are able to provide round the clock nursing. Uh, we can meet whatever skilled nursing uh, that our participants, residents require. Uh, but again, this is all assessment based. So the, the dollars are driven by the need. And before the need is presented, you don't have the dollars. So we know we have to invest in the medical services before the need arise, or arrives, but we have to do it in a, a, a sustainable way if that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of where we're putting our our, uh, our heads around right now in terms of the strategic plan and making sure that we're doing that as intentionally and as fully as possible. Also knowing how shaky the, the you know, just being able to uh, recruit and retain nursing, uh, you know, can be right now. And uh, we, we do a lot of medical education for our staff, you know, the DSPs are the eyes and ears, but we also, in terms of psychiatry, uh, we have a local psychiatrist uh, who we work pretty closely with. Most of our individuals uh, see him and then he coordinates with our medical director as needed in terms of uh, management. Wow, that is awesome because really that's an element that is lacking with a lot of HCBS is that level of coordination, you know, and even with HCBS, people are often complaining about this intense need for case management, right? And you've kind of built in case management um, to your model. And, and that doesn't exist with a lot of these people who get HCBS programs. And um, that's a whole other discussion. 
Well, I will add, we don't get funded for anything we provide. So that's all uh, that's us saying, let's provide those. Let's supports. do that. Yeah, no, well, this is a, yeah. And it. that's a big problem, um, especially with the severe autism cases right, in, my, right. in my view. Um, sure. Okay, I will not detain you any further, but um, wow, uh, Dustin, this has been super informative. I am betting that everybody who requested this episode are more than happy <laughs> with with what uh, what you had to say today. Um, again, I, in the show notes, the link uh, bittersweetfarms.org, link to the book. Um, and um, any final words before we go? No, just thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for all that you do and uh, for all that your listeners do to help the uh, autistic community uh, and uh, those we serve. So really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Dustin. It's, it was great meeting you and um, hopefully this will be up soon and hopefully we'll have you back on Autism Confidential after this. I would love that. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Confidential. If you'd like to learn more, share an idea for an episode, or become a sponsor, please visit us at autismconfidential.org. The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the individual speakers. Content presented is for informational purposes only, and we do not provide any medical or legal advice. Music